this is what's kind of crazy for me to see is just like Greg has been seeing all of these developments coming from the lab right in the beginning. And now everybody is trying to press all of these technologies into either new products or to plug them in as new features. And you're right there on the front lines trying to help people understand how to even do this productively. Uh, so exactly. I'm, I, I, I am really enjoying this transition. Greg, thank you very much. And Arini, how is it that people should be thinking about these things? Uh, I think they should still be grounded uh, with like you know good product principles. Uh, the pro the problems that customers face are remaining the same. It's just that we have another really powerful tool in our toolbox, and I think um, starting from the customer problem is going to be the key. I think customer problem, great. Uh, do you have slides that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, uh, this talk is about uh, the LLM's value proposition for a business, uh, specifically when um, you know LLM itself isn't your product, but uh, you got to build LLM features for your existing product. So this is uh, hopefully the, the the takeaway from this talk would be, you know, some set of frameworks that would be useful when you're um, uh, trying to build LLM features for your um, existing products. Um, you know, as a product manager in AI field, I, I generally box the large language models into three uh, major categories. One is a uh, user-facing chat interface. That is the type of product that we see uh, most of the times uh, out there, you know, as a customer service assistant, as a some kind of an expert system um, that, you know, is trained in some complex topic and then answers the customer's uh, questions. And then, you know, it can summarize complex topics. Th this is the kind of uh, uh, product that we see a lot, starting from like OpenAI and like Anthropic and everything. The other... Um, type of uh, bucket that I box this into is uh, still user facing, uh, but they are fine tuned for specific tasks. So it doesn't have to be like Q&A type of uh, interface, but it's like more like, you know, um, natural language to some kind of query language, right? Or natural language to some kind of domain specific structured output. Say, for example, if you're in cybersecurity, you know, um, natural language to like shell commands. Um, so the the third box, which I'm going to concentrate probably more in this talk, is uh, non-user facing um, applications of LLM, where LLM is just a layer in before your final uh, product, right? So it can be used as a feature engineering um, engine or like a label enhancer, or uh, more so, you know, used for turning unstructured uh, data into tabular features, which can be used for your uh, traditional machine learning models. And this particular use case, I think it's not being talked about a lot, but which can give you value pretty quickly, right? Um, again, um, as I said before, when you are when you are the product manager for like um, uh, for your AI team, and you know the leadership says, you know, okay, now this is this cool tool. How are you going to use it? I think the very first thing that a lot of teams do is, you know, list out whatever projects they have and then say, okay, can we uh, use LLM for this particular project? And I think that's uh, kind of the uh, opposite way of how we should look at it um, because the customer problems are always the same, right? Uh, you already have like a set of customers who are facing a, a sort of problems and your uh, product has a mission and a vision that solves that. So keep loving the problem. Uh, just keep, just adapt your solution, right? The customer problems re remains the same. The user persona that your product is targeting remains the same. So your solution still has to have, you know, good product sense, still has to have robust data machine uh, and machine learning foundation. Uh, LLM is going to be that another powerful tool in your toolbox. Uh, so this is another uh, framework that I think a lot of product uh, folks are familiar with. You know, it's the value versus complexity um, uh, graph. Uh, here in the um, uh, x-axis, you can see the, um, the the amount of effort that you need to put in, in terms of building a product versus in the y-axis, you have uh, the, the value that it generates, right? In the older paradigm, before LLMs, you go with, you know, which has the uh, lowest effort, the highest value, you start with that, and then you go with which has the higher effort, which becomes like the, uh, which goes into backlog, and then you, it's a long-term project. But I think after LLMs, post-LLMs, you, you, you can target all those grunt work, like, you know, which has a lot of uh, uh, human effort going in, in terms of, you know, uh, transfer, like, um, uh, um, 
using unstructured text and then converting that into like a structured uh, features and then, you know, labeling all those um, um, high, um, which needs a lot of effort. Now you can uh, use LLMs to target that, right? Um, so here's another very um, uh, famous uh, product frame, uh, framework, um, uh, you know, proposed by a Japanese researcher. It's called Kano Model. I think a lot of product and leadership folks would already be familiar with this. Uh, to give you a quick background, the x-axis is uh, the, the the features that you're implementing, right? The y-axis is the user satisfaction. So there are these basic features that, you know, it has to be there for a customer to be uh, satisfied, right? And then there are these performance features where, you know, it linearly increases the uh, user satisfaction. If you add more performance features, the user would get more satisfied, right? But there are these delighter features where you put in very, uh, the, the customer would not be expecting that feature, but if you implement that, um, uh, they're going to be extremely um, uh, happy with that. And that is the hook that you, uh, you hook the customer in. And I think uh, LLMs are that kind of features. For example, uh, OpenAI, right? Like how, um, the, how accessible they made like a very uh, complex technology to like, um, uh, general population. I think that's a, a great example. And LLM can be the delighter feature um, in, in your product suit. Um, coming from a cybersecurity background, I thought, okay, let me go through the use cases that I can come up with, which are not um, chat-based, but which can give um, uh, immediate value, right? So uh, one particular uh, problem that has been uh, uh, plaguing the cybersecurity industry for a long time. I joined the security industry in like 2017, and now it's like more than six years. We talked about alert fatigue back then. We are still talking about it. Um, still all the CISOs in the company, they are not satisfied with like any vendor that is attacking this problem. You have hundreds of thousands of alerts per day, and the, the security analysts are not going, uh, not able to you know, go through every single alert, and that's been a huge problem, right? Um, uh, now think about LLM as uh, a, a tool to attack this problem. You know, it can take in enormous amount of you know text data, like you know alerts and like log data sets and everything, and it can summarize those. It can uh, br uh, bring structure to the the tons of unstructured data that you have, right? So um, this, this is a great example where LLM itself would not be a user facing um, uh, product, but it would. Uh, tremendously um, help making your existing product uh, really effective, right? Like summarizing alerts, like increasing the explainability in alerts. Now you don't have, don't want to have like um, really, uh, uh, you know, big cybersecurity experts going through all the alerts, you, uh, which is really expensive, right? So now you can have all these LLM um, expert systems and assistants who can who can um, uh, help you with that, right? And all these. Um, uh, pattern and context finding among alerts from like different sources, right? Different vendors. Um, another big uh, problem in cybersecurity is labeling or the lack of labels, right? You you, you have tons of data, you don't have um, uh, enough labels, especially for uh, malicious and attack data points, right? So uh, that's another area where LLMs can be used, you know, for, for simply going through all the um, events and then um, uh, training them, you know, fine tuning them on like specific kinds of attacks, and then they can start labeling um, uh, our, our data, and and that would be a, an extremely useful um, task when it go when the data goes into your um, uh, tabular, you know, data sets, and then gets fed uh, fed into like uh, traditional machine learning systems like XGBoost. Um, another use case is unstructured log data, where you know you have tons of logs in cybersecurity, and uh, the, the biggest use case is t turning them into tabular data sets. Right? Um, so I, I think this is the probably the takeaway from this talk. Um, you know, going through all the use cases and all the the uh, blog posts from like the the current products that are using LLMs. Um, I think I, I've come to the framework that you can you know, uh, uh, do the check before uh, starting an LLM feature in your product, right? The first, uh, I call this l the Lumos framework. And the first one is list the solutions. What are the existing solutions that you have? And then where does LLM fit in, right? 
And then the second one is uh, user impact. How uh, directly is your user going to be impacted if your LLM feature is going to be um, implemented? And then the third uh, one is measure. You know, can you, uh, once your LLM feature is uh, implemented, can you measure the metrics? Can you measure the market feedback? Can you, can you go back and then, you know, tune uh, the model and then tune how you are, the, the UX and everything? Can you measure everything? That's one. Uh, another one is over deliver, over deliver on delight, right? The, the LLM feature is the one that's going to give you that uh, half factor. So, uh, make use of it. And then, um, sustainable, it's going to be, is it going to be sustainable in terms of cost, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of scaling your, uh, uh entire pipeline? Um, so yeah, once you go through this, uh, list, I think it's going to be useful to see whether you want to Im implement that LLM feature and, um, uh, yeah, this is, I think, the biggest takeaway that I would want to have from this talk, I think. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's about it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Arini. This has been fascinating. We have a couple of questions from the chat. So let's see here. We have Michael. He's asking, do you see LLMs for things like feature engineering as a production solution or mostly for prototyping brainstorming? Seems like a oh, lower, more expensive way to solve something that could otherwise be done with other methods. Um, I still believe in going from the least uh, complex to, you know, slowly uh, going over the graph. So uh, it could be expensive, but I, I definitely see it as a, a, a good option for production feature engineering, because especially in cybersecurity domain, um, the, the amount of data, the, the sheer scale of data you see is like tremendous. And then uh, I personally have seen very you know, projects get delayed so much because you don't you simply don't have labels. And then the, the model metrics itself are not so great because you cannot validate them. So I think in those cases, the return on investment is, uh, uh, should definitely uh, be a lot more than how, how much um, you know uh, cost and effort that you're putting in. I think. Yeah, we got one more uh, from Lucas. What are your thoughts on risk LLMs introduced in the cybersecurity context? So for the non-chat use cases, there are several where the LLM being wrong could be incredibly costly to the customer and security company. Oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, where the LLM being wrong could be incredibly costly to the customer and security company, it feels like a targeted ML model would be more interpretable and less risky. Uh, that is very interesting. And I think the risk is involved uh, with LLM in general in terms of all the security challenges, you know, the prompt injection and everything. Um, I, at, at least based on my research, I think the risk is, risk is more uh, in, in chat-based scenarios where, you know, you don't have like uh, guardrails in terms of, you know, what you uh, input and what you output. Um, wh when you're having LLM as a layer in your ML pipeline, I think you can add in a lot more layers in terms of having the security controls, you know. Um, uh, you can add another layer that is checking your labels. Like you don't have to like d directly plug in your labels to, you know, a production model. I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll have uh, more tests and uh, which is more practical uh, because it's not user facing. You can, you know, iteratively add more uh, uh, security layers. Um, I'm hoping as you iterate and as you experiment, you uh, you'll be able to get that optimal scenario. Um, uh, I would definitely link this user to a blog post from uh, Honeycomb.io a blog. I think uh, I think the product leader is also speaking here today. Um, uh, there's a very cool blog on that and how they are uh, basically solving the quest, uh, the problems that you you just talked about. Yeah, on that note, I see here Houston saying, this is a good presentation, exactly what we are working on, especially around alert fatigue. Uh, that's awesome. I would really love to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, chat with that uh, uh, person. Yeah. We still have a few more minutes. Any chance you could put up your slides again? I have a question for you. Uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to go a little bit deeper into that user delight product slide. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, is this the one? Let's see here. The Kena model. Yes, the Kena model. So give me one second. Over time, delightful innovation becomes another basic need. And what does this say about kind of like the urgency with which people should be trying to adopt these new technologies. Because on one hand, you do have this, I mean, you, you have this added benefit that you're quick and that you are quick to delight and that could impress yeah. your, your, you know, your customers and they can enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you run too quickly, you might be introducing 
this out of target chair. Um, but no, absolutely. And uh, th this is one area that I've been uh, reading up a lot uh, in terms of what are current, um, you know, uh, uh, companies doing. And uh, this is where I, I would again point out to uh, the blog post from um, uh, Highcom.io. Um, I, I forget the name of the person, but uh, he, he is giving talk here as well. Mm -hmm. They uh, talk about uh, having a one month timeline uh, that they set for themselves to have a, a LLM feature, um, basically to uh, take in natural language and then convert that into a honeycomb query, right? So they have like a LLM uh, assistant. Uh, it was interesting because they have, uh, they had set up a very small, like a month uh, timeline. And I think it made sense because the more you wait, the more, uh, you know, models come out, the more uh, 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 better models come out and then you would keep waiting, I think. Uh, so if, if you see uh, a fit, uh, a product market fit in terms of, you know, your customer is going to get, uh, uh, get use from like a specific feature that you think about right now. And then you have thought about the sustainability in terms of cost. And then if you have calculated all those stuff um, and, and they talk about, you know, using GPT 3.5 versus four, uh, GPT 4. Uh, using uh, GPT 3.5 costs them hundred thousand dollars per year versus it would cost them millions of dollars if you go for GPT 4. So you know you do all the um, uh, fine tuning and then do a lot more fine tuning than you would do for GPT 4. So considering all those you know um, optimization of costs and time and effort, I think uh, the the sooner you re uh, once you realize something is going to be useful for the customer, I think. Um, um, having a, a product ready um, uh, would get would get you uh, quicker feedback as well. So I, I think the biggest uh, lesson from that blog post was, you know, the feedback that they got from their users, you know, what's working, what's not working, and they could easily uh, fix very easily solvable um, problems that increase their accuracy from like, you know, 78% to like 92%, which is um, accuracy of the LLM uh, query uh, generator, uh, which is, I think, awesome. Yeah, one of the things that's always attracted me to AI is that it it feels like because it is pushing on the frontier of intelligence, it gets us to constantly sort of re-examine what it means to be human. Insofar as you define your humanity to be at all tethered to your intelligence, well, now you've got some competition, right? And so it just forces <laughs> us to reevaluate. And it feels to me like there's a similar thing going on with business like you could very quickly just jump on the bandwagon and start like indexing on this technology and try to, un to roll it out in a relatively unrigorous sort of way or you right. could just be tethered to your customer and then say that is yeah. I actually need from me what problem am I actually solving right and like you're saying to fall in love with the solution it feels to me like AI can sort of force us to better understand our own problems and the problems of our users more effectively. No, ab ab absolutely. You're absolutely right. I think uh, always falling back to, you know, are we solving the customer problem? I think that's going to be the differentiation between, you know, a good product and a great product, I think. We got a couple of things here. Um, how can companies build trust in LLM solutions and products? Any, any tips on that? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think it again goes back to product -led growth. Like, you know, the more uh, you, you put your product uh, out and then you iterate and then you get to a better and better solution. When you see, and you see, and you saw that, with, you know, we see that with ChatGPT, you know, how they have hooked that customer, you know. Now, if another company is going to come up with the same uh, type of product, I would not immediately jump unless there's like a big uh, different feature. So um, I think... Uh, the product itself, the product led growth, you know, the product itself would uh, keep speaking with the customer if you have that hook. And in terms of uh, uh, creating that trust, um, I think there are, there are two ways. One, uh, if, if I see it differently from whether it's a, a, a business user versus an um, uh, end user. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think for a business user, uh, you start talking to the team and you start evangelizing your product and you, you talk transparently about what are the challenges. Um, I, I think uh, the, the customer would uh, be hooked to that even though there are bugs and even though there are challenges, I think you 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 will still have the customer hooked um, if there's transparency and if there's a, a, a good communication. 
And if it's like an end user, like, you know, how we're using um, uh, uh, ChatGPT, you know, every other person is using, um, I, I think simply the customer experience. Uh, uh, people forget a lot. A lot of times people forget about uh, UX, like uh, user experience um, uh, in data products. Um, uh, giving a lot of thought on, on, on that area and then making sure, you know, you're um, uh, transparent. And then if there are any like data related issues, being very transparent on the product. I think would uh, keep the customers hooked, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have a fireside chat on stage one. It should start out in just a minute. I think there's also one more question here that Lucas asked, which is a follow-up question. Uh, if the answer is involved, you guys could take it offline, maybe on Slack. Yeah. I will read it, at least for the benefit of everybody. Follow-up question from Lucas. I was thinking less about prompt injection and more about things like hallucination. So what if the LLM assigns a, quote, benign label to a malicious alert, and now the customer doesn't know to stop an ongoing attack because the LLM said the behavior is the, was observed as normal? Uh, so mm -hmm. that's a common issue in other models as well, but those are purpose-built classifiers and not next word predictors being repurposed for classification. Uh, uh, no, that's an interesting uh, question and a very uh, practical scenario. Uh, again, I think going back to the point, I would not probably have, uh, at least in the beginning, where say I'm the product manager, we are, we are releasing um, a, a feature for having LLM as a labeler, right? Um, as a first uh, iteration, I'll probably not have just the, the LLM labeler and then directly go, going to production model. I will have... Uh, maybe an ensemble of models, another model that would be a checker, another model that would give a, a confidence score uh, of some way. And then you can, I think, have a threshold of, you know, give me the, uh, accept the labels only, which has like a confidence score of more than 90% or whatever. So I think um, uh, tuning with those and then understanding, you know, um, you, you can go back to the feedback and then understand you know, where the uh, LLM is, you know, um, having a wrong uh, label and then going back and then figuring out what's the false negative, what's the false, uh, false positive, what is uh, causing that and everything. So uh, I, I think in the initial iteration, I'll definitely not have just the LLM model as, uh, you know, uh, a, a labeler, but have more uh, guardrails around, you know, how you're choosing that label. But well, it, but we'll still it will not give like a hundred percent uh guarantee just like you know if you didn't have that labeler you you might as well still have that false negative because you didn't have that label before um so yeah i, I, I think it's um uh, comparing and then uh, optimizing for what's the uh uh the, the final result already thank you very much mm -hmm.